Great. So in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I know we'll have some additional folks kind of trickling in here. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things. Well, first of all, uh, my name is Lisa Escobedo. I am the Assistant Vice President of Civic Engagement and Advocacy at uh, Altamad. Uh, I've been at Altamad for about seven weeks now. It's been a really exciting journey, but my, my background has been in civic engagement um, and ensuring that uh, all these other social determinants of health, like um, you know, job security, um, uh, environmental justice, um, kind of every aspect around health equity and around um, uh, kind of justice for our community is what I've worked on for the past about 13 years. So I'm really excited to now be at Ultimate and to be joining you all here today. Um, I'll also share briefly that um, I was born and raised in Southeast LA, in the city of Bell Gardens. I have been doing national work, but I uh, always go back to my roots. And, and so this report is just very interesting to me and uh, such a pleasure to do this work again with my colleagues uh, at Altamed. Uh, just a couple of things before um, I talk a little bit more about Altamed and our services and why we're doing this work. Um, if folks could just make sure that they stay muted um, uh, unless we, uh, until we get to the last portion of the uh, telephonic, which will allow folks to ask their questions live if they uh, are so in are inclined to do so. Um, but for now, just please make sure you stay muted. We're, uh, I'm pretty certain that we've um, kind of did a, a mute all function, but we've all been on those Zoom calls and on those press conferences uh, virtually where um, you know we sometimes forget and we're having kind of side conversations and then we realize it might be someone uh, uh, forgot to uh, forgot to mute themselves. Um, and so with that, um, you know the, the other uh, kind of a uh, really quick housekeeping item that I'll mention is if you do have questions throughout this presentation um, and you wanna make sure that you don't forget your questions so you throw it in in the chat, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, myself and some of my colleagues um, will be monitoring the chat so that at the very end, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. Um, we'll try to uh, flag your question and bring it up towards the end. Um, additionally, we'll ask folks to use a raise hand function um, so that at the end, we know which folks would like to ask their questions live. And so we will be managing that towards the end. Um, and so we just ask for folks' patience. If we're not asking your questions, we are going to have a section uh, uh, to do so. I'll also mention that it might be the case that some of our speakers may not uh, be able to be with us for the kind of full duration of, um, of the presser. In that case, if you do have a question, we will make sure and get those questions to them and get back to you um, in a timely manner. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Altamed. For more than 50 years, Altamed Health Services has provided access to uh, health services regardless of the ability to pay, both in Los Angeles and North Orange County. It is the largest, we are the largest independent federally qualified community health center in the nation, serving more than 300,000 patients annually. And I'll briefly uh, mention uh, that uh, healthcare centers in the state, community healthcare centers in the state of California actually serve about about 7.2 million uh, uh, residents of the state. Um, and across the country, we're looking at over uh, 30 million. So community health centers, in addition to Altamed, right, play a, a key role, not just in healthcare, but in other um, social determinants of health in our community. Our patients are largely from Latino communities that have been uh, probably the hardest hit by COVID-19. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Uh, as a civically engaged healthcare provider, we know that there are many factors that impact a person's health, right? Such as stable housing, uh, uh, access to food, access to healthy food, educational resources, transportation, access to green spaces, and many, many other social determinants of health. Our programs help to inform our patients on the issues in their community that they can shape and empower them with the tools to do so. And so this is why um, maybe many of you are, are, um, are kind of questioning, why is there an assistant vice president of civic engagement at a healthcare organization? That's the reason why we feel that a healthy community, um, not only healthcare wise, is also healthy when they are empowered to have a voice in the process in their communities and can hold their elected officials and appointed officials accountable on the issues that are really important to them. And again, have a lot to do with making sure that our communities are healthy. 
Um, and so uh, you'll hear a little bit from our uh, other team members in my department around their civic engagement efforts. And again, happy to talk to folks at the end a little bit more around what we're doing, not just when it comes, again, to healthcare and uh, other uh, issues like transportation, housing. Today, we're going to talk about education, but we're also doing quite a bit of work on making sure um, that Latinos, um, like in the area of Southeast LA, are also engaging in the voting process, the redistricting process for the state, um, and are also um, engage in every decennial census as well. The survey that you all are about to hear about today um, uh, is on the educational impacts in Southeast LA, um, specifically around COVID-19. It is one of our major projects to improve the quality of life for those who reside in our service areas, which again, uh, a big portion of that area, Southeast LA. Um, and so uh, to talk a little bit more about this, this survey that you all came to hear about, to talk a little bit more around this impact right, of education, technology access, um, and just talk a little bit more about the methodology for this survey, I, I'd like to introduce uh, my wonderful colleague um, and uh, who I had the pleasure to work with on this particular project, uh, Rosa Vasquez who is actually uh, one of our phenomenal contractors at Ultimate and works under the Institute for Health Equity. And she's gonna share a little bit more about our findings. Again, please include your questions on the chat and we will get to them uh, accordingly towards the end. So with that, uh, Rosa, I will pass over my imaginary mic to you. Thank you so much, Lizette. Um, I will be sharing some slides um, to kind of go along with all of this info. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. Um, so just some background on um, this survey. So Ultimate and Jay um, got a grant from an organization called Great Public Schools Now. Um, and we decided to develop and implement a survey in Southeast LA that could measure the impact of COVID-19 on the education of CELA families. Um, and the reason why the title might be a little broad is because we're not just focused on specific education outcomes like grades. We really are focused on the holistic definition of education, including like the health of students and their ability to tap into an education system and of their families. Um, and you might be wondering, like, why was CELA selected or why was Southeast LA selected? Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. So one of the reasons um, is that Southeast LA, before the pandemic, was already one of the most socially vulnerable uh, regions in LA County. Residents in the region are disproportionately more likely to face and experience various social determinants of health. And social determinants of health kind of um, focus or kind of uh, is a reference to all of the other kind of factors that impact an individual's health in their community. So that includes um, access to transportation, access to affordable housing, access to having enough food to eat. Um, and it really just is like all of the th things that people are living through um, and all of the stress that they have in their lives, how that impacts their health. So beyond just like their physical ailments, I guess. Um, and also beyond that, CELA is home to a lot of people. It's home to 440,000 um, 440, residents uh, of whom more than 90% identify as Latinx and 44% of CELA residents identify as immigrants and two thirds of them don't have citizenship. Um, and last August, CELA emerged as an epicenter for COVID at the county level. And then later in that fall, emerged as an epicenter for COVID at the, at the statewide level. Um, and this was because the folks who live in CELA are people who work in what we now consider to be essential jobs, right? These are the folks who got back to factories when maybe it wasn't necessarily safe to get back to those jobs. They're the ones who, you know, carry the restaurant industry. They're the ones who are getting back to jobs that maybe didn't have access to PPE. So there's a lot of reasons why these folks um, were, you know, having to get back to work as soon as possible. Um, and also that these jobs weren't protecting them. And then simultaneously, they're coming back home to a lot of them to multi-generational households where it's not safe to, um, or it's not necessarily, ex ex isolating is not accessible. Um, so what we have is this very socially vulnerable community, um, then being um, 
facing factors that made them more vulnerable to COVID. And then that causing kind of a huge explosion ex explosion of the pandemic in that region and a real devastation of the community. Um, but this is because SELA has been disinvested in for decades. Um, this region has kind of been relegated to the sidelines and to the margins, um, not only in terms of investment, in terms of funding to this community, but also in terms of who is listened to um, and how the voices of these community members are elevated. Um, so really what happened was that Southeast LA was purposefully put in a vulnerable position. Um, and now we are seeing that the pandemic really impacted this region. And if we don't get recovery correct, um, this region could be further marginalized in the future. Um, so that's why we decided to partner with um, GPSN to launch the survey here in Southeast LA. Um, and it's not to say that Southeast LA is one of the only or the only community that's facing all this. We chose to do Southeast LA because we know that Southeast LA is a reflection of other extremely vulnerable um, across the country. And this one just happens to be in a area that we have a lot of clinics in, so we have easy access to. But we think that the implications of this survey have a, have or the findings of the sur survey have larger implications. Um, so just a little bit more background on the survey design. Um, we just began designing this back in January. Um, and the survey itself contains 25 questions available in both English and Spanish. The questions revolve around demographics, um, that, COVID-19's impact on education directly, and then more broadly, social determinants of health that the families were facing. Um, and it was deployed through clinics, uh, through our two of our clinics, using our civic engagement census model. Um, we also did geotargeting on social media, and we had community partners um, like Desi Services out in Southeast LA um, implement this survey to their participants. Um, and we really wanted to reach uh, 15,000 households and receive um, 2,000 responses in order to produce what we felt would be community-informed data to fully understand the impact of COVID-19 on this vulnerable community. Um, in terms of the data analysis, so descriptive statistics were used um, to show this impact on CELA communities, and then regression analysis were used to evaluate relationships between COVID-19 and psychosocial outcomes, and then educational outcomes amongst the students. Um, and then in order to figure out what um, the impact of being low income and being Latinx um, had on all of these findings, we did a mediation analysis, um, which answers three questions. What is the relationship between COVID-19 related impacts, income and ethnicity? And then what is the uh, effect of COVID-19 related impacts on these um, psychosocial and educational outcomes? And finally, how did income and ethnicity mediate or explain the relationship between COVID-19 related impacts and these outcomes. Um, we started off with 5,116 respondents. Um, after uh, kind of controlling for geography, so really focusing in on the Southeast LA cities, we ended up with 2,482 respondents. And then after extensive cleaning and validation of the data, the final sample was 2,093 respondents um, with at least one student in K through 12 in East LA or Southeast LA. Um, demographic breakdown, which I'll just go over very quickly, um, just to show that, you know, our sample was reflective of Southeast LA and of the region. Um, almost almost uh, over half of our respondents reported that their income was between $35,000 and $75,000 um, a year, which um, is aligns with the CELA median income of $40,500 a year. Two and three respondents um, are people of color or identify as Hispanic uh, or Latinx. And oh, sorry, half of them identify as Hispanic and Latinx. And about 40% of survey respondents reported they were, uh, they had more than one student in their household. Uh, so now to get to the results. Um, we, knew, we already knew that Cal in California, socially vulnerable communities were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Our survey confirmed this. Um, our survey found that about nine in 10 respondents reported that their family experienced one or more COVID related impacts, um, including changes in income, job loss, family death, or hospitalization. Um, two thirds of Latinx families uh, reported that COVID-19 impacted their income directly. And about a quarter of Latinx families experienced job loss due to COVID-19. Um, and then also a quarter of, lo of low-income families um, saw uh, experienced job loss. And Latinx families were also significantly more likely um, to report having to deal with death and, death and hospitalization in their immediate family. 
This is important because um, when considering the educational outcomes of students, we have to also consider the stressors that COVID-19 placed on their families, not just how the transition into um, virtual learning went for them. So not only do we have to consider, you know, access to technology, access to broadband, um, you know, access to space, say, uh, safe and quiet spaces to do their work. We also have to consider what is going on in their households, like whether or not these students have um, access to, you know, just like stable housing, whether or not um, these students are living in a household that is struggling economically. So it's really important to first identify how COVID-19 has impacted this community to be able to analyze these educational um, outcomes. Um, and what we found was that these students, because of all of these impacts from COVID and because of all the stress that they're currently dealing with in their family, um, they are seeing higher levels of learning loss and less academic support during the pandemic. So a survey found that roughly one in two respondents expressed concern about their children's quality of education. Um, about one in 10 respondents, it's about 10%, said that their children were not at all prepared for any of the um, major um, like school um, subjects. So it includes English, math, history, or social, sci uh, social studies, and science. And about one in two um, children whose family experienced COVID-related impacts reported less academic support during the pandemic. And that um, is compared to the one in three students um, or three respondents whose family has not experienced COVID-related impacts. Um, and also amongst families who reported COVID-related impacts, um, one in three children reported grade, grades worsening compared to one in six children, almost half of that, whose families did not have any impacts. Um, the next part of all of this is that um, we learned that this pandemic and all of the impacts that it had on the families created new barriers to learning. Um, and that the more COVID impacts that a family is facing, um, the more likely they are to be dealing with negative ed educational outcomes. And also that being Latinx and being low income actually exacerbated these negative educational outcomes further. Um, so these top three bullet points um, kind of run through the comparisons of the data that you saw on the last slide. But I really wanna bring our attention to the bottom of the slide, which is um, how ethnicity and income impact or further exacerbate these negative educational outcomes. Um, two thirds of Latinx families reported worsening grades in their students. Over half of low income families reported worsening grades as well. And about one in two Latinx and low income students do not have their own um, room to do their schoolwork in. And that is almost three times higher than um, non Latinx, non low income students who also um, did not experience any COVID related impacts. So, what we're seeing is that experiencing COVID related impacts and being Latinx and low income um, are further placing these students in vulnerable positions um, that is causing negative educational outcomes. But what we really um, kind of wanted to focus on was these psychosocial outcomes, because we believe that these are the outcomes that are going to be around the longest in our community and are going to be the hardest to solve. So among our respondents, we found that K through 12 students um, slash families in Southeast LA uh, showed heightened vulnerabilities that map onto long term psychosocial and physical health. Um, nearly one in two respondents reported they were concerned or very concerned about their children's um, psychological well-being. Among Latinx families were actually twice as likely to report being very concerned about their children's psychological well-being. About one in two respondents uh, responded that they were concerned or very concerned about their children having enough to eat. That number jumps to three in four low-income families. Um, being concerned about having enough food to eat. And then over half, about 60% of our respondents that they were concerned about their children's uh, long-term physical well-being. So what we're seeing is that um, the pandemic has created a new system that, has, that is worsening health inequities in the region and is creating new systemic barriers for these children to be able to access recovery, especially because this community doesn't have access to a lot of you know, mental health resources, um, or a lot of like, um, or this community is also a medically underserved because that's why Ultimate kind of operates out of there. Um, but something else that um, is really interesting is that once again, the more COVID impacts the family a family deals with, the worse these um, outcomes become. So, for example, if a family uh, had dealt with 
three or more um, COVID related impacts. So if they had a change of income and job loss and family hospitalization or death, um, we see that they are really, really concerned about their children's psychological well-being and extremely concerned about, um, you know, their children having enough food to eat. So what are arching theme um, and major trends? One, that due to pre-existing social vulnerabilities in Southeast LA, Latinx and low-income families were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Two, um, our survey confirmed that the pandemic exacerbated pre-existing educational inequities in CELA communities, and Latinx and low-income families are seeing higher levels of learning loss and less academic support to mitigate that learning loss. And then finally, our survey found that the pandemic created a system that is worse, worsening health inequities in the region and exacerbating all other social determinants of health, creating barriers to recovery for this community. Um, and here's kind of like the, the mediation analysis, which connects how COVID-related impacts um, is leading to these psychosocial and educational outcomes. And at the center here, we have income and ethnicity, because what we believe is that although income and ethnicity played a role in this, this, this community's vulnerabilities before the pandemic, what has really happened is that it has kind of been an underlying current throughout um, the whole pandemic and is playing a role in every and how and how the pandemic is impacting every aspect of their lives. Um, so we do think that there is a correlation here. We do think that there's a connection. Um, and yeah, there's more information on here. Let's see. Okay, so conclusions and recommendations. I think we might get to this after we hear from um, Dr. Shapiro and our families. I can stop sharing this now. Um, so next I would like to introduce Dr. Shapiro, um, who I'm sure some of you may have already interviewed at some point or another. He's our ultimate star, so I'll hand it over for now. Thank you, Rosa. It's, it's a very powerful conversation that we're having today. And uh, a lot of the times that we have seen, uh, that life has changed. Uh, we, we already knew at the beginning that this was weird, that, you know, like the, everything that we knew changed. And we thought that there was some type of, uh, you know, thing that was normal before and right now it changed. The sad part that as you heard right now, there's things that never changed and actually are getting worse. And those are the things that are happening with our familias around the area. And this is a reflection, not only on the area, but it's consistent with things that we hear in New York, Chicago, Florida, Dallas. And the sad part is that, you know, we, we use a lot of the word resiliency and I will go back to that point. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we we're going out, our communities were told to stay at home, to just hold on there. And it was okay for one or two days at the beginning of 2020. But when you have lack of food, when you do not know if you have enough money to actually pay rent, when you actually have troubles getting your medication, that compounds, then you need to go out. You do not have the luxury to just stay. You go out and what happens? Automatically, as an essential worker, you're more exposed to other things, public transportation, other people, lack of PPE, protective personal equipment. And of course, the money is not there. And it starts, you know, with a little bit of depression, anxiety. How can I bring food to the table? How can I do all these things? And sadly, this is not new. As a physician here, I can tell you for sure that I have been fighting diabetes. I have been fighting obesity, hypertension, depression, and anxiety for years. Right now, the, the, the crumbling effect that we're having has been amplified by COVID-19. And a lot of people went, you know, like, you know, and, and I had a lot of, uh, of, of uh, you know, 
one of my patients that comes to my heart right now is it's La Señora Maria, you know, Miss Maria. Um, she was the grandma, La Abuelita, la, from a from, uh, family that I take care of. And uh, she came to me and asked me, Dr. Shapiro, why is this happening? Why our families, our Latino communities, our underserved communities are being suffered or targeted by COVID-19? Is there something genetic to it? Is there a problem around it? Or, or, or what, what, what's happening? The reality is that this is not, not something new. We have been suffering for decades, decades, where our kids, you know, they don't have green spaces. Our communities are outside near pollution, near problems with environment, near a lot of the social stress, you know, there's food, but the quality of food is not that good. And everything compounded, and you add just a touch of a pandemic, and you have the disaster that we were seeing. That's why we need to create strong communities. At the moment that we are out there and that we were on the top of the, of, of the pandemic, our community was actually in most of the ICU units. The majority were Hispanics. And that's not a miracle. That's why we compounded all the social determinants of health problems that we have in front of us. I'm here because I can do and give absolutely everything in my power as a doctor inside of my clinic and outside in the, in the hospital. But that's 10 to 15% of the health. 10 to 15% of, of the health of someone else. The magic happens outside that door. When we go out there and we start changing, being represented, that's where La Señora Maria will have all these things so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back. That's where La Señora Maria will have the opportunity and power to be heard. Someone else told me uh, a couple of weeks back, um, you have always two choices when you're inside of a, you know, we're around a table. You can be with the table or be the main dish. If we're not represented and we do not understand what's happening with those numbers. And we can go like, you see, we always knew we live there, we live here, we see it, lo vemos, but this is actually what's happening. We want to change that, we really do. Information is power. As you know, and, and one of the things that, you know, we're, we're hearing a lot is that the heights and they have a beautiful phrase there. We are no powerless, we're powerful. The option right now to actually change the way that our society moves, we have it right now. Why? Because we know that resiliency, it's equal of biting a bullet in, in your teeth. Ah! But we need more than that. We need healthy communities. We, we need wellness. We need promotoras to be out there and making sure that everybody that needs information, we can actually give them that part. Right now, we know that our community, it's not that they don't want information. It's not about education. We're, we're fighting every day to bring food day by day to protect our families. How can a kid actually right now, uh, we can promise them anything right now if, if in reality they can only have limited access to food? Would they learn the same way? Would they go to the same universities? Would they have a different expectation or they will be in survival mode all the time? That's why it's so important and powerful between each of us to make sure that we point the fingers where, where we see the lesion, where we see the bleeding and we do not just put a bandaid, where we make sure that that doesn't happen again and we recover from that. Why? Because this is not the Hispano community. This is not the African-American community or the underserved community. This is a reflection of something that we can do better. COVID-19 has brought us a light on a lot of things that we have for Maria, for Manuel that I was talking about him. But right now we have the option to do two things because spoiler alert, there will be more pandemics. There will be. 
spoiler alert, we already had in 2009, the influenza virus pandemic, the H1N1. And we were very lucky, very, very lucky because it was not as bad as this one. But I can promise you, if we do not grow, it's not about resiliency, if we do not grow healthy communities, the outcomes of the next pandemic will be exactly the same ones. Right now, the responsibility is on our shoulders to make sure that Marias, Manueles, Joes, anybody, they will have an open opportunity to get that health, that information, that wellness, to get a better option to start healing our communities. And that's why, and with this I will finish, I promise, we need to continue vaccinating our communities against fear with a dose of truth. We are there, we're there to empower because we're powerful. Thank you so much. And at this moment, I will sing the Bamba. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. Um, I'm at, so we actually have two members present here, Marta Fierro and Guillermo Marin, who um, will be sharing their testimonials and like their experiences in Spanish. Uh, Marta and Guillermo, ¿quieren abrir sus cámaras? Señora Marta, sí, pase cuando quiera. Sí, buenos días. Mi nombre es Marta Fierro. Yo vivo aquí en la ciudad de Carajay y quiero platicarles un poco acerca de lo que pasó con, el, con mi familia con el COVID-19, que ha impactado a mi familia en la educación de mis hijos. Y este, yo tengo tres hijos y este, ahora en la, en la pandemia también impactó la educación. Tuvimos problemas con la tecnología que la tecnología, si se conectaban al mismo tiempo, este, la, la tecnología nos, este, no era muy buena. Y también, aunque en las escuelas nos dieron hotpad para sus clases, este, la, de todo la tecnología pues no servía. A, y también teníamos problemas por el, la falta de espacio, porque pues, los niños aquí en la casa se distraen con facilidad y no ponen mucha atención. Este, las clases sí era, eran virtuales, y, pero pues no, no, era lo, lo, no era igual que las clases presenciales. Así que hubo falta de ayuda, falta de soporte en eso. También este, pues el estrés de la pandemia, que estuvimos aquí encerrados, este, la falta de comida, las rentas demasiado caras. Hay, eh, yo conozco familias que están viviendo sus carros porque las rentas son muy caras y tiene que, también tiene que unirse este, hasta de dos familias para poder pagar la renta. Este, pues mi esposo, mi esposo perdió el trabajo, este, también eso nos afectó. Que aunque ahorita ya está trabajando, ya no estamos acomodando, pero también esto nos, nos afectó. Mi hija, la más chica, este, tenía tanto miedo de, 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 este, de contagiarse, que se este, lavaba las manos este, cada ratito, las tenía demasiado rojas, tuve que llevarla al doctor, porque eso también era un miedo que le, que le daba, y, y limpia aquí, limpia acá, quería que, tu, que estuviéramos limpiando todo el día, esto también como que le afectó, también la transportación para ir a recoger comida, no teníamos mucha transportación, y este, la falta de cosas esenciales, también como cubrebocas, cubrebocas, can sanitizer. Este, también aparte tenemos que cuidar los sobrinitos de, de mis hermanos para que ellos pudieran trabajar. Y ahorita también estamos batallando mucho con la, con la gasolina que está demasiado cara. La comida también está subiendo demasiado ahorita después de la pandemia. Este, estamos batallando también la falta de vacunas, que no había muchas vacunas por aquí, por la, con nuestras comunidades. Ahorita ya parece que estamos normalizando, ya hay más vacunas, este, falta de, de recursos, sí subimos mucho con falta de recursos. Para ir este, a agarrar despensas, este, a veces teníamos que pedir raite para que 
pedir comida porque estaban este, regalando comida en partes, pero no teníamos transportación. Estamos también trabajando con una asociación que se llama Innovation. Es para ahorita para poder apoyar que haya mejor educación en las escuelas, que haya fondos. Esto es lo que estamos ahorita trabajando. Es una organización que se llama Innovation para, para este, pedir fondos para que haya ayudas para nuestras escuelas, como este, tutorías, que es lo que no tenemos. Este, había unos programas que estaban en la escuela de mi hija que se llama Academia de Catlón y ahorita los han quitado por falta de fondos. Y es lo que también estamos peleando para que en las escuelas haya más ayuda y más apoyo. Muchas gracias y que tengan bonito día. Muchas gracias, señora Marta. I will be um, translating or, you know, um, kind of giving the big ideas after we hear the second testimonial. Uh, señor Guillermo. Uh, sí, bueno, buenos días. Buenos días a todos. Digo, este, mi nombre es uh, Guillermo Merín y vivo en la ciudad de Maywood y vengo representando a mi comunidad que ha sido afectada con la pandemia, tanto a mis nietos y como a los niños de esta comunidad. Uh, yo tengo, yo tengo dos, dos nietos, uno de edad de, de, de cinco y el otro de siete. El, uh, el que está en, el que tiene cinco años tiene, digo, está en el pre, en el uh, pre-kinder y el que está, el que tiene siete años está en segundo grado. Uh, la pandemia nos, la pandemia nos ha afectado, gracias, no nos ha afectado gracias, a, digo, este, en salud, pero sí nos ha afectado en, en este, en la educación de los, de los niños, especialmente de mi nieto, el más, el más chiquito, el más chico que tiene, que tiene cinco años, que está en el pre-kinder. El, y el problema que tienen esos niños es que no están recibiendo las clases como deberían. Y a largo plazo eso les va a afectar en no recibir lo básico como en las clases, como en las clases regulares. Me, ojalá, digo, este, me gustó lo que habló el doctor, digo, ojalá que, que este, que, que, que mi nieto llegara a ser un doctor, digo, porque este doctor piensa que sí, uh, pelea no tanto por, uh, por este, por la, por la, este, por la comunidad, ¿verdad? digo, ojalá que mi niño, digo, mi nieto sería, digo, sería espectacular que llegara, llegara a eso, pero lo veo yo muy difícil, lo veo difícil porque eh, especialmente este, este, uh, especialmente porque el, el, uh, ha perdido, se ha perdido casi como un año de infracción desde el primer kinder y ahora ya, ya lo van a pasar a, a primer, digo, hasta primer grado y el niño no, si, es como toda la gente, si no tienes una base, si no tienes tú una base para este que te han dado en el kinder, pues no va, digo, va a estar muy difícil que este que, que logres que, el, que vaya a lograr metas, al menos al menos que que este uh, que se pudiera que las escuelas pudieran este encontrar una uh, unos fondos para que los niños tengan su tutería, ¿verdad? Digo, a unas clases especiales para que los ayuden después de este tiempo que ha estado, que se ha perdido. Y es, y, y es importante, ya que, ya que nuestras comunidades no pueden, ya que nuestras comunidades no pueden pagar la tutería, o sea, digo, es difícil para, para gente que, pues, que, que gana buen dinero, ¿verdad? Digo, pues ellos sí podrían este, sobresalir, ¿verdad? Digo, pero nuestros niños que son de esta comunidad, los veo muy difícil que vayan a salir. Este, también me gustaría, digo, yo tanto como la señora, la señora como yo, estamos, este, estamos, este, uh, pertenecemos a un grupo que estamos peleando para que el gobernador dé fondos para programas que ayuden a los niños de este, de, de, en tutería, ¿verdad? Digo, para que los, eh, digo, todo ese tiempo que se ha perdido, que lo vuelvan a este, a uh, que se vuelvan, digo, que vuelvan a ser este más, uh, que sean productivos, ¿verdad? Ese es, ese es, la, ese es la, la, este, la, la, el cuestionamiento de que el gobernador, ojalá que diera este, diera buenos, este, ¿cómo se llama? Buenos, uh, uh, estos fondos que los, que los, uh, los encaminara a nuestras comunidades. También este, 
el, lo, lo más importante es que queremos que, queremos que este, que ojalá que, 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 que ahora que se está figurando cómo solucionar los problemas del COVID, que, que vean algo sobre, sobre la educación de nuestros, de nuestros niños, ¿verdad? Digo, uh, está bien, digo, eh, hay salud, digo, está bien por la salud, pero la comida, ya pienso que no hay problema, pero lo más importante se nos está olvidando, educación, como dijo el doctor educación es lo que tenemos que tener, digo, y si esos, y si esos niños no, no tienen educación, pues no vamos a llegar, nuestra comunidad no va a llegar muy lejos. Okay. Eso es todo y muchas gracias por su tiempo. Gracias, señor Guillermo. Um, so just, you know, to quickly summarize what they shared um, before jumping into conclusions, I think this actually um, is a perfect segue into conclusions. Um, Señora Marta, who is from Karahe, um, shared that, you know, her husband lost her job. Her daughters are undergoing a lot of stress, um, including one of her daughters was so stressed about the pandemic. She was kind of incessantly washing her hands. And she has seen so many families struggling economically to pay rent, um, folks living out of their car, and a lot of other factors that are impacting their education, including her own three children having to share even the school provided hotspots and being unable to connect to the internet and having to leave classes. Um, and so your Guillermo, um, I'll share that, you know, he has to take care of his grandson who's in pre, um, pre K so that his daughter can take care of his seven year old. Um, so that they can each focus on one child to be able to get them on track for their education. Both of these folks were invited here because they are actually part of a organize. They're actually you know, organizing with Ultimate, but separately they have been involved in the fight for more funds for schools around tutoring. Um, and that is, you know, their their ask. And then here are our recommendations around where we feel, you know, the next step of all of this is. Um, so number one is that we think that in order to fully recover this community, um, we need to expand our, um, you know, definition of recovery um, away kind of just from education itself, but rather in order to address these very specific outcomes, we need to address the social inequities that led us to this place. So one, invest resources in community engaged research to better understand the depth and the impact of COVID-19 in socially vulnerable communities. Two, build an inc inclusive process to engage community members in planning COVID-19 recovery initiatives. Community is, are the people who live through this and they're the ones who have the solutions. Um, three, develop regional equity plans that address the multifaceted impacts of COVID-19. Um, and four, invest in community resiliency by addressing key social determinants of health through community-wide approaches and civic engagement. I think that this, um, for us, this survey really reinforced Ultimate's commitment to civic engagement because the only way that we recover these communities is by empowering them, by building long-term um, power so that they can advocate for themselves so that the place in which Southeast LA was at before the pandemic that allowed the pandemic to devastate the community so widely that we never get, that we never have to undergo that again for any disaster. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Lizette for questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Rosa. And I did wanna um, just quickly take the, the uh, uh, personal point of privilege here to um, thank Rosa for all of her hard work around this uh, particular survey um, and thank my colleague who I believe is also on uh, Cynthia Romo from our civic engagement department um, who have just, who just did a phenomenal job in working with our partners at Great Public Schools now um, in not just executing um, this survey, but really figuring out how do we use this survey to inform our um, educators, our school districts, our elected officials? How do we use this survey and the findings to um, share with partners that potentially have very similar communities like Southeast LA, but maybe in other parts of the state? Um, and so our hope is that the findings and what we learned and the recommendations go beyond today and that they circulate in our communities um, and really for the benefit of our communities as we uh, get things going, right, as our, our kids go back to school um, for many of us in August. Um, and so really just wanted to thank them for their incredible work, their sleepless nights, um, of really making uh, all of this happen. Um, so with that, um, folks uh, may have seen that in the chat box, uh, I asked those of you who may have questions um, to either uh, do one of two things. One, you can um, add your question in the chat box and we'll read it out um, and we'll have some of our speakers answer those questions. Or 
you can use the raise hand function, which um, uh, should be under your, when you click on reactions on your screen, there's a raise hand function there and we can call on you um, if you select that. Um, I see, I see no, um, I see no hands raised right now, but I do want to give folks about a minute or so um, to use that function or to drop in your questions. Um, so we can uh, briefly go into that. We have about 10 minutes to work with. Um, and so the sooner we can, uh, folks can let us know what their questions are, the better. Um, and I see that Dr. Shapiro is still on. And so also thanking him for the great work that he does in uh, serving our communities in every aspect, right? Not just in their healthcare and wellness, but making sure that they're empowered. And uh, he did a, a, an amazing uh, virtual event for us around making sure that our communities understood the, the redistricting process. Now that California, right, um, is losing a seat, making sure that we have a voice in how those congressional lines are drawn in the state of California, which is through a commission process. So thank you to, um, to everyone that has really taken that on in, in the health of our community physically and the health of our community uh, uh, civically um, and through all these other social uh, determinants of health as well. So I will uh, keep on, give folks about another minute or so. If there's any of you that um, are, don't know how to use the raise hand function, haven't dropped in your questions and just wanna um, unmute yourselves, you can do that too. Um, and you know, ask away. So we'll give folks about a minute here before we we close up. All right, that means we had a we we answered every question before you had them. Um, great. So what I'm going to do now is in the chat box, I am dropping in contact information. Um, uh, for folks who may have follow-up questions. We know you heard a lot today. Um, we'll have uh, um, the recording available for those of you who want to hear it again, want to hear some of the details. Um, some of you, um, you know, will be following up with a comprehensive report um, as well at some point. Um, but if you have any follow-up questions, you want to schedule some time for interviews with any of our uh, community folks who spoke today, with Dr. Shapiro, with um, my colleague Rosa, with myself. Um, I am dropping in um, contact information for my colleague Sandy Rodriguez at Miller Gear, who is a person that will be coordinating any interviews and any follow-up uh, press requests. Um, I will leave it there for a couple of minutes in case uh, folks want to write it down, take it down. Um, and with that, if no other questions, and let me do one final scan as promised here uh, for any raised hands, and I see none. Uh, so with that, this uh, culminates our, uh, our telephonic today. We hope that we can continue to stay in conversation with you all. We hope that you can get this message out so that we prepare for a speedy recovery in our communities and that our communities continue to see the investment needed, not just in education, but in every aspect of this reopening of the state and their communities and their kids going back to school so that we can thrive and be successful. We know Altamed is committed to that in our service areas and beyond. And we hope that you will join us in, in that commitment as well. Uh, thank you everyone. And we hope you have a great rest of your week and weekend. Thanks everyone.